Lance uh, asked me to ask you a yeah. question. He said, okay. ask Sean about 1992 when you told him, we'll see who's laughing when you turn pro, boy. That sounds I like a... George, George that sounds like a that Sean one. Yates question, right? Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Move podcast. A new episode today in our special series, The Move Legends. Um, I'm Johan Bernil from Madrid and all the way over there in Greenville, South Carolina. Good morning to my co-host, George Hinkeby. George, how are you? Good morning. Good afternoon, Johan. Very excited about our guest, special guest today. Big legend in our sport. Um, I feel like our sport in, in one way is one of the most beautiful sports in the world, but it never shows the respect that our legends quite deserve. People like Sean Yates we have on the show today, um, an iconic figure in the sport of cycling. Um, so many riders in, in my generation, your generation, looked up to Sean because of the hard man he was and because of just his, his, his upbringing in the sport. And just, he just was one of the toughest men I knew. And, uh, you know, I got a couple of stories that I'm really excited to share and I'm just looking forward to having an awesome conversation with Sean. Yeah. Well, you said it, uh, our, our, our guest, total legend, in my opinion, um, you know, especially for, for many people from inside of the world of cycling, you know, he's been a great cyclist himself, won stages in the tour de France, uh, the Vuelta got the yellow Jersey in the tour, many other wins, but I think he's especially known to be a legend in terms of hardship. In fact, his uh, nickname on Wikipedia is, I checked it just before we, we, we started this show, it's The Animal on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, so I want to welcome uh, to the show, uh, Mr. Sean Yates. Sean, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm fine. Thank, thanks, Johan. Thanks, George. Good to be here. I'm fine. Um, yeah, still alive. I'm great, still great an to... animal. Still an <laughs> animal. I'm more, more of a pussy cat these days. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where are you, Sean? How are you doing? Uh, what are you up to lately? Yeah, I'm in Spain here. I'm in Spain, not that far from Madrid, um, but near the coast in, uh, in sunnier climes uh, than Johan um, at the moment, certainly. But um, what am I doing? Not a lot. Um, I'm just in a, living in a little village um, with my partner and my young boy, who's 10, goes to the local school. Um, I do, I ride my bike. I do a few events through the year. Um, I visit my family in the UK quite a lot. I do still do some gravel events, um, mostly with my, one of my sons or both my sons that do gravel events. And in fact, this year I'm coming over to the US because um, the younger boy is doing Unbound. Oh, oh, really? Wow. Yeah. So that should be fun. Um, cool. But yeah, I mean, time time flies, really time flies. There's always something to do. Um, but yeah, at the moment I'm running quite a lot, actually, because I've got an event in May, which is um, a kind of big goal kind of thing for me personally to uh, to get through it. So, you know, but I'm doing good. Well, yeah, and, and uh, let's get Sean, you, you still have your coaching, your coaching activities also, I guess? I still do a bit of coaching, yes. I've got about 20 clients all online. Um, some clients come over here for, for a week or so, and we go whining a lot. Any excuse to get out of, my, out of my bike, you know, I do a bit of motor pacing as well. I coach a local pro. Um, but, yeah, just basically the coaching business i'm not working with any teams anymore i kind of had enough of that really or the traveling around um but yeah coaching and a few events and riding my bike that's so sean when i when i heard you coming on the show i just I thought, thought of my one of my first memories of you was i don't know if you remember we had our our training camp at carciano carducci tuscany and i was a young punk kid 19 years old and here i am thrown in the wolf stand with Guys like Phil Anderson, Steve Bauer, Sean Yates. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? Our first big ride was like a five hour ride. We go up this nice climb and I'm thinking, you know, I, I want to impress these guys. I want to show them that I'm, I belong here. 
So what do I do? I attack over the top of the climb and it's a descent down to the bottom to the I hotel. I remember exactly. <laughs> and I'm going full gas. I'm going down the ground and I crash <laughs> in front of like, these guys are the, right behind me. I'm, they're like, what is he doing? And Sean wrote by me. He's like, fucking idiot, man. <laughs> and just shakes his head. I don't I'm going, oh, working. I just totally screwed this. Well, maybe you didn't say fuck, but I just felt like such a, a, a an idiot doing that. But I was just wanting to impress guys like you. And I, I think, never George, I think, I, I think I made of myself. <laughs> I think a better word probably, it got probably going to have said bloody idiot. That's, that sounds more I like know, it. I, yes. I, I recall you attacked <laughs> over the top on, on the downhill. Yeah. And I came and I was like, okay, I'm going to have some of this. And I, <laughs> I went, I've caught you up and went flying past you. And I, I turned around and said, don't fuck with me, boy, or something like that. You know? <laughs> but then maybe. And Maybe then I ended up on the ground. Yeah. You're yeah. so frightened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you were, you, you were known as one of the best descenders in the Peloton. Uh, you had that crazy style. Um, a lot of riders tried to mimic it after you. And um, I mean, where did you, how did you get such good descending abilities, you know, growing up where you grew up? Obviously we didn't have the huge mountains to ride down and learn how to do that. No, no, you, that's correct. Um, I don't really know. Um, Obviously, at a certain point, I realized that I was no good going uphill, so I better be good going downhill. Um, <laughs> so then I kind of, you you know, practiced quite a lot. Certainly when I lived in Nice, I did a lot of climbing and therefore a lot of downhills. Um, and, you know, I developed a strategy, if you could call it that, for the big mountain stations, the tour. If you've got three passes, it's say. Then, okay, normally on the first, they go quite steady, can hang on, no problem. But then I'm like, okay, I need to hang on a second. And I, you know, I hang on the maximum and then do a mad descent to get back on. Then I, then you're in the valley for the final climb. You know, if you get dropped on the second climb, you've got to ride the valley, you know, tempo to limit the deficit to the front. Um, whereas if you stay on to the base of the final climb, you can ride easy peasy up the front, which, you know, next day means your legs are better than riding all day hard. So yeah, I definitely use that to my advantage um, on several occasions, but I, you know, I, I like, I, like, I still like speed. I still go flying down, you know, the mountains. Um, I've got a scooter and I kind of pack it everywhere on that, crash it a couple of times, um, you know. <laughs> So that's funny now that you're a coach and people ask me this all the time. And, you know, now that cycling has grown so much amongst the, uh, you know, the populations here that, that aren't, you know, grown up riding bikes is like, how do you teach descending skills? I know for you and I in particular, I wasn't a great climber either. It was more of a survival sort of thing where like you're dropped. If you don't catch back up now, you're never going to see the front group. So you're not actually thinking about the balance on your bike or looking ahead of a corner is instinctual. It's survival mode. So how now as a coach, how are you teaching your clients to descend? Because I'd like to know that on personal basis as well. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, one good thing that um, if, you, if you do go skiing, off-piece skiing, there's a, a, a phrase that you, which is called soft focus, which means you don't just look at the tree in front of you or the corner in front of you. You look at everything. No. And you know, you see in the film sometimes when they've got like a robot or something and it's scanning, you know, and all these numbers come up and, it, you know, so it's all going into the processor. So you've got to, you know, when you're going downhill, you're looking ahead, you look at the motorbike lights, you look at the, the barriers maybe or lack of barriers, the tarmac, the surface, uh, the gradient, the, the camber, and just kind of, you know, calculating all um, and 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 you know descending accordingly. I think you know obviously you can only go so fast around a hairpin, no matter who you are. Where yeah. I gained a lot of time is where I just didn't touch the brakes. Where you you know because obviously every time you touch the brakes, you lose speed um, and and stop your momentum. So where I really gained time was on a really fast sweeping descent where you didn't touch your brakes and you just carried that momentum, which, you know, really made up time, which is obviously not a skill, but it's also like a fear, really, you know? 
Yeah. And also the, the Peloton is such a small community after years of years of riding with the same people, you know, who you want to descend behind and you know, who you absolutely don't do not want to be behind on a big descent where, you know, they're going to screw you up. You know, they're going to break in the wrong places and you'll see that Jersey or that particular rider and be like, I need to be far ahead of this person or give him some space because I got to ride my, my speed down this thing. My tactic was at just before the summit, to get in front of everyone who was anywhere near me. So I would be first. I didn't want to yeah. behind, be behind anyone. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember, I remember some of those stages, like for one particular stage in the Dauphiné in 1990 or 91, where you, you, you made up like two minutes on one downhill. Five minutes. And Kelly, five came, minutes. My, Kelly came to the, this is true story. Kelly came that evening, Sean Kelly, he was in the same hotel as. Was it, was it 19, 1990 or 91? 1990, yeah, 91 maybe. Yeah. And he went around to mechanics and, and, and he was looking at my bike thinking I had something special because I went past him like he was standing still <laughs> uh, and buying hoid on with these guys. I actually met, it was down in, <laughs> into Grenoble. To, descent on one of those smaller climbs crosses the valley of the outdoors valley and up the other side anyway yeah that was one of my fast descents but i also made up um two and a half minutes on the descent of the madeleine before we climb up to where's that super one long one um about to walk <laughs> and yeah. i had kevin schwartz in the team car behind me because <laughs> <laughs> he came to visit he was a friend of Lance um, that year um, and uh, yeah I closed a two and a half minute gap on the descent and made it back to the group and that was the yeah. day there was 50 guys eliminated I think on the time yeah. cut but they reinstated them all uh, Sean a part of a part of these you know stories we, we're, we're going to talk about some more in your career as a cyclist What's the most memorable moment that you have the best, the best memories of, you know, you won stage winning the tour, yellow Jersey, Vuelta stage, Grand Prix at the Mercs. Uh, you know, what, 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 what's the, what's your best memory? Um, I don't, I don't know. I think one of my best memories is the 94 Paris Bay. When, yes. when George was up there and Frankie, and um, Tamil had gone 50k from the end, and Johan was there, was trying to chase him, blew up. And, and I was with Bardato when the shit hit the fan about 40k out, I think. And it was guys everywhere. And I came onto the cow for Desarb, and just before that, we caught Museo. And I was second on the road on the cow for Desarb, you know, and obviously screaming fans, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> That was a that was a big um, yeah day for me. Well, um, well, Sean, and talk and talk about those those conditions in '94. I remember w- waking up my first Paris Bay, and I looked out the window. It was snowing. You first, and you it, where we come ninth, did you? No, 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 no. That was for, I think Frankie came out. I crawled to the finish line. I was one of the last finishers. I think only forty guys finished that race, but it really yes. defined the rest of my career because I was able to start a Paris Roubaix, my first ever a race that we've all dreamed of riding in the snow alongside of you, Frankie Andreu. And you guys were like, you didn't even care. You had shorts on. I don't think you even had gloves on. It was snowing at the start. <laughs> and I'm thinking we have 165 miles to go. And like Sean, Sean is just so excited. And I could just see the motivation here. You didn't care that there was going to be the worst possible condition, arguably one of the worst Roubaix in our history. Um, and I, and you, I, what'd you get fifth place? And it was just, fifth, I was just yeah. so impressed with your result. And I just remember I was one of the last riders left on the road and I go, I, I cannot not finish this race because Sean will kill me <laughs> because you know, <laughs> yeah. he's like, you better finish this race boy. And uh, yeah, I crawled to the finish line, probably 20 minutes or so behind you or even more, <laughs> but I was one of the last finishers probably, I think I was like 28th or 30th place. Wow. Uh, yeah. That, that was an epic one. That was an epic one. Obviously, as I said, Camille had gone off the front and we hit that four flat about 4K out. I, mm-hmm. I, and I knew Baldato, someone was going to attack, but my legs were just gone. <laughs> and and, 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 and uh, Ballerini attacked, Baldato went with him and I couldn't go. And then say, but second and third. And that's the, that's the, the is that the, the, the Paris-Roubaix edition where Museo was trying out this special, special yes. bike? 
the Yankee yeah. bike and pedals, yeah. and he yeah. couldn't get his feet out the cleats. That yeah, was double suspension, uh, I guess. Double suspension yes, on a road yes. bike. Yeah. 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 Uh, ironically, fast forward, uh, what, um, 12 years later, my best Roubaix ever, you were in the car uh, one, as one of the directors when I got second place. So that's kind of interesting yes. that uh, you were there for my first and, and there for my one of my best. But also well, my you best had that, that, that terrible incident when your stem broke, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was there there as well. Yeah, that was so on, 2005. That yeah, sorry, nothing. 2005 I got second and 2006 my, my stem or my steerer tube broke. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that was her. That was scary. Yeah, I picked yeah. you up there, George. I remember. Yeah, it was one of those crashes where you you crash. Cyclists, we we get up right away. You go. <laughs> this one particular, like I'm done. I can't move. Like that was yeah. that was so, so painful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sean Lance uh, asked me to ask you a yeah. question. He said, okay. "Ask Sean about 1992 when you told him." We'll see who's laughing when you turn pro, boy. That sounds I like a jo George. That sounds like a Sean one. Yates question, right? What what's, oh, yeah. what's what's the story behind that quote? Um, well, that, that that's when we Lars joined us in in nights two. I think he was still an amateur at the training camp in Santa Rosa, and for some reason, we ended up riding a lot together. Um, often just me and him, you know. And um, we there was one big loop. I think it went, what's that road? Tim Barn Ridge or something. And he kind of came back down towards Santa Rosa in some some redneck little village in the, in the trees. And we went into this convenience store, you know, a little one. And there was a guy in there who was not um, all there, really. Let's call it, <laughs> say that. And, and Lars was kind of taking the mickey out of him, you know, <laughs> um, saying, yeah, he's a bit of a retard or whatever, you know. And I was like, you know, you need to be a bit more respectful. And I, um, and I said, yeah, we'll see you laughing when you, when you turn pro, boy. <laughs> 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 and I guess he's never forgotten that because every time I see him, he mentions that. Um, <laughs> yeah. One of our other newer partners is BuyCycle. I'm going to spell it out for you. So when you type it in, you're going to the right place. It's B-U-Y-C-Y-C-L-E. And this is such a great service, whether you're buying or selling a bike. Uh, go out into your garage and look around. There's probably one or two bikes that you haven't touched in a while. Maybe you should sell it and put it towards the purchase of something uh, uh, that you that you want on BuyCycle. Uh, it's really incredible, the service they set up. There's over... Uh, 20,000 in inventory over 30 countries and it's may make it incredibly simple to sell your bike to them uh, they'll send you the the uh, everything you need for shipping you know no going down to your local bike shop and digging around in the dumpster for a bike box they'll send you everything you need and get you uh, uh get you all set up to sell your bike so sell your bikes on bicycle b-u-y-c-y-c-l-e enter this code jot this down we do 24 WEDU24, and that will remove the seller fee uh, when you want to sell your bike. It's B U Y C Y C L E dot com. Obviously, Lance had the last laugh in, in, in a lot of areas. Um, um, but yeah, I remember we rode a lot that year. And one of the reasons was as we were talking about descending um, to teach him how to go downhill. But that time we were trying out these specialized new tires you know called amagamas and they were absolutely freaking lethal you know <laughs> it's like going down on ice oh man <laughs> yeah yeah and obviously the the, the technicians these we're talking obviously a few day, years ago that yeah these are great the this is the best compound you know and the, but it was lethal and in fact when we went to tour sicily we just couldn't ride them so we ended up taking all these Michelins off um, Castorama and it was like we were going twice to twice around the corner and the first day we got those tires on, uh, Max Chiang won a stage, you know. But, yeah. They, they... Yeah, a, a, lot, a lot of people don't realize the, the sort of 
snafus we had with equipment choices. I mean, I remember the first time we rode, uh, I think it was carbon wheels and Amstel Gold Race, Johan, and it was pouring yeah. rain. <laughs> None of us had brakes in Amstel Gold Race. It started raining about 50K in, and all of a sudden we, we know how steep the climbs are on Amstel Gold Race. It's all about, it's like the race of a million corners and downhills. And we're all on the radio. like, we can't stop. We, we were in the middle of the peloton, hitting a corner, and all of a sudden have to go to the front without stopping. Like, it was one of the scariest moments of our lives. But that we've was, all gone through those different That was scary disasters. in the race, in the race uh, for you guys and in the car also. We ran out of... We ran out of spare bikes. We ran out of spare wheels. We had nothing. I mean, it was, it was, the, the, you know, they didn't, the, the mechanics or, or the manufacturers didn't find the right combination yet between brake pads and, yes, yes. and the yeah. carbon wheels. And yeah, yeah, that was, that was scary. Yeah. Sean, I, um, I want to go back to, uh, you know, I mean, at the beginning of my professional career, you were already a seasoned, uh, and well-established, uh, champion. Uh, but I, I mean, there's one particular, um, moment that I, I hated you. Okay. Do you remember which, do you remember when, when no. that was Not tour sure. of Belgium, 1998? Oh yes. You won that race. Uh, and I was 88. Yeah. 89. Oh, sorry. 89, 89. Yeah. 89. So I, 89. 89 yeah. Nine, sorry. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. 80, sorry. Sorry. So I was, I was, I think I was second year pro. You know, young pro in Belgium, and um, there was uh, the second or the third stage. I think I was, you know, I was in a breakaway in the morning stage. There was a double stage. Yes. And um, and um, so I made it to the finish, and then I find, and then you know, they actually I was in the lead. I got the leader's jersey, but no, but actually they gave it to you. So they made a mistake. I mean, I, I, I shouldn't have hated you. I should have hated the commissaires, you know? but <laughs> they, they stole the opportunity of me going in, you know, it was close to my whole town. It was in Russelara. The stage was in Russelara yeah, yeah, morning yeah. stage. And I, I, you won the time trial the, in the afternoon, I guess. And so you took the Jersey anyway. Um, but so it was, it was, it was strange because the stage finished. You, you had to go to the podium, uh, to be the leader, but then, they realized their mistakes and I did the time trial in the leader's jersey. So, okay. you know, I, I said, I don't like this guy, Sean. Yes. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, but, punched, uh, it, then, I punched it in that time trial. But you <laughs> won the time trial, right? Or, yeah. or, or was it Franz Maassen who won it? I don't remember now. I don't know. Anyway, you ended up are. winning the tour of Belgium. Yeah. 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 That's so, a long yeah. time ago, man. Time yeah. ago, a long time ago. Just back, George, um, when you, my first memory of you is probably not the first memory, but we actually shared a room before your first race, didn't we? Yep. Yeah. You had the, that GT bike, you know? That, oh, in, uh, in uh, Como, right? Yeah, yeah, in Como. Yeah, it, that's right. It would have been Milan Turin, wouldn't it? Yeah, because it was my first race as a stagiaire. So it wasn't a Was that, was that 95? That 95? was 90, 93, the end of 93. Season, oh, 93. Like okay. I do. Yeah. I, I, I also do remember that because I, yeah. I, I remember one vague mental picture of this tall, strange guy on new, new <laughs> guy on Motorola with a, a, a different bike. And then that, that, yeah. that was in, in Italy in the last races in Italy. So you guys yeah. were you, roommates then. You were in the break. You went in the break, didn't you? Well, I don't know if you remember, but, um, we, we, yeah, we were roommates and I, I'm pretty sure it was that race, but there's a start the start of the race. Every, there's a bunch of attacks. We didn't have radios at the time. And I'm just like this newbie kid. I didn't know what was going on, but I was excited to be there. I'm, I'm sitting at the back and I'm just like, Oh shit. I'm at the back of this pro peloton. This is amazing. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm, like we're, we're hauling ass. There's attacks everywhere. And I just see like somebody from the front of the peloton, just sit up and turn around like this. And I go, Oh shit. And it's Sean. And he goes from the front of the pack to the back with his head facing back. And I go, is he, is he looking for me? What, what, is he? And he gets to the back of the pelt and he goes, get your ass to the front, boy. <laughs> he stared me down. I go, okay, okay, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> Oh yeah, I think I think it was that race. I ended up making the breakaway because uh, you scared the shit out of me, basically. <laughs> <laughs> were, Sean, were you were you a bit of a bully in those days, or what? Were you a bit of a bully? I, I guess I must have been. You know, <laughs> no, he was not a bully. He was just very, you know, he was a great, an amazing leader, and I think uh, he just knew tactics really well, and he just 
even though I was a kid, he knew that I needed to be there helping the team. And I think that's, that true. No, I don't think I know that translated so much for his successful director uh, career afterwards as well. I, I guess people call me, uh, yeah, I think I'm quite blunt. Um, and <laughs> I guess a, a spade is a spade. I mean, if you've got a job to do, then yep. might as well do it properly and get on with it. Um, and not yeah. beat around the bush. I think that, yeah, that's what, um, what worked for me well um, as a DS, you know, often yeah. at the same time having respect for the riders, but you know, knowing that they're there to do a job, they're getting paid to do a job as am I. And yeah. you know, just get on with it, you know. Now, obviously, if you, if you know a guy's not the help and help doing doing the job or going up the road or doing whatever, then you mm -hmm. know. Um, but I was very lucky in my career as a DS to be always be working with good athletes, you know. Speaking, like speaking of speaking of getting on with it, Sean. I want to show you this picture here and, and, and ask you what's the story behind this picture? <laughs> oh man. Do you remember this? Do you remember this picture? And, and what, uh, what can you say about this? I can remember this picture. This was in the Tour de France, somewhere in the massive central and Marina Argentina yes. on the stage. Um, yeah. Me and Phil Anderson were at the front of the bunch and suddenly I was on the ground. Um, what I think happened was someone came across me and just took my front wheel out. Anyway, I kind of jumped back up and if you look at the, the, the bandage there, I had a hole in my kind of artery and blood was spurting everywhere. Oh. <laughs> and so I had to hold my hand up in the air like this with, you know, holding the blood in. And Phil was right next to me, and he was, we were just trialing the helmet, you know. And um, not trying the helmet, the radio, sorry. But his helmet was all, like, broken. And that was when we had the radios in the helmet type thing. And Phil, yeah, yeah. Was on the, Phil was like, man down, man down, you know? <laughs> and oh, that, man. Particular day, that particular day, we had a five-star general in the team car from the U.S. Army. And I don't know whether this is kind of, and I think he had a bodyguard with him. And this bodyguard like, jumped out of the team car with his gun almost, you know? Anyway. The, the doctor, Dr. Paul, I think it was at the time, came up, bandaged my arm up, you know, um, and I, made, I got to the finish. And I remember the late Paul Sherman came over to interview and I said, fucking hell, Paul, you only, you only want to in interview when I, me when I crash. <laughs> so what, what year was that, Sean? That was, would have been 92, maybe. Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I have a follow up question whenever you're done talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to say, I needed, I needed the hole to be sewn up, you know? Yeah. Oh, I, I just wanted to, I, I, I just wanted to show this picture to that it really pictures the hardship, you know, of, of, of Sean Yates. And I had heard the stories. I was not particular I, a person, I was not per present myself. Uh, but I had heard the stories and, you know, about the artery and the blood spitting out and, and you just, you know, having it like a tourniquet, like, okay, yes, let's yes. close this down and let's get on with it. That's why I wanted to, you know, show you this. <laughs> so, My yeah, leg so, was bloody stool. I know that much. So that was pre, um, pre, I would say you, you looked up like a normal cyclist there. Then all of a sudden you went with, uh, this iconic word that we all still use today, the regime. And I remember sitting next to you when I first keep turning pro. Also, another thing you do is you, when I, by the time I got there, you were probably, I don't know, 10 kilos lighter than that picture. Although you were very skinny there, but you went from that yeah. to like nothing because you started doing the regime and you would look at all of us and always talk about the regime. You would sit at dinner. I remember like, we'd be at this amazing Italian villa having a great meal, incredible bread. You would like carve out the bread and not eat the bread part and just eat the crust part. I'm like, 
why, why are you doing that, Sean? Regime, boy, you better, you better figure out the regime. <laughs> so you, and it was amazing how, how lean you were, but you were one of the first guys that just said, well, realize how important power to weight ratio was, I guess at the time, not that many people were doing that. And uh, you went from that picture to, I, I, hopefully we can find another picture to what he looked like two years or three years later, how much weight he lost. What, yeah. what brought that on and how'd you get there? Well, uh, when I moved to Nice in the late eighties, um, I realized that, yeah, I was previously, I was pretty big, you know, um, as an amateur, um, and I realized that going up and down hills, you know, you need to, to be lighter, like you say, watch the kilo of we don't, didn't know about watts in those days. Um, but, and no one really told us, you know, um, hence we didn't, you know, pay much attention to our weight or getting lean. Um, but I mean, the bread thing was something the French told me because they said oh, the, the interior blows us up in your stomach, you know, um, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I, you know, one of the main reasons was I really like to stuff those bread ends with bits of cheese and olive oil, olive and oil. <laughs> and garlic and, yeah, and, yeah. and, and wherever, you know, found it really tasty. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I realized that when I moved to Nice, I did pretty much live like a monk, you know, just, just riding a bike, um, not eating little, I had nothing in the, in the, in the larder to not to be tempted. And, and yeah, it definitely, it definitely helped. Although my weight did fluctuate during the year because for the classics, you want to be a little bit hairier. Of yeah. the store, you want even lighter. But I also realized, yeah, that I, I um, unlike maybe some, I didn't need that much to survive, to eat, you know, to, to, to perform. Um, because I'm, as an amateur, I never, I never ate on a ride, you know, um, five hours flat out, <laughs> six hours, you know, um, which was obviously completely different to today's, you know, strategies where fueling is a be all and end all, you know, um, which obviously is logical because, yeah, you don't drive a car farm in UK on an empty tank. You need to have fuel in it. When it's sitting in the garage, it doesn't need fuel. So, you know, um, I don't know. I just knew that maybe just part of my intimidating act to call you, <laughs> flag you off the whole time, George. I don't know. Yeah, I was a bit of a bully, I guess. <laughs> No, you were, you were, you were, you were great. It was great to, to be part of that. Um, it's just, certainly I learned time. so much. And obviously, you know, that was a fantastic team to be in, wasn't it? Yes. Um, yeah. With Oach, because, okay, we were on the continental scene, but it wasn't super pressure, you know. Um, yeah. It was joke, you know, Oach was super relaxed most of the time. And it was more like a family and we, we got good results now and then. And, you know, it wasn't like we were the, the super team where we had to win everything. Obviously, cycling was different back in those days as well. But it was, for me, it was, and, you know, you and, and Frankie and all the other guys. It was super, super good atmosphere, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the perfect environment to do, do a good job when you had the good legs. Yeah, and you you were part of the ninety. Well, you were a major part of the ninety five tour. I, I don't know if you remember. I went there and I did the team time trial training with you guys. Yeah. And the day before, they sent me home and they took uh, Carcitelli. And unfortunately, we all know what happened there. But um, that must have been a really tough tour for you to be part of that that whole experience. Yeah, it was. But obviously, yeah. But I actually left the tour before Fabio, you know, passed away. Um, so I had a tendonitis, which had been playing around for, for a lot of the year. And no. I actually packed the, packed the day that Lance lost the stage to Uchikov, you know? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's right. And obviously prior to that, we had the stage to Mond where the onset attacked Induine, you know? And it was like, just held the leather all day long. Um, and I believe Andrew, Andrea Perron was in the very us or up there for us. But yeah, it was a hard talk. But yeah, I, I wasn't there. And obviously, yeah, it was it was a terrible, terrible, um, mm. terrible occasion, moment yeah. in time. And I was at the funeral with with um, with 
God, what's his name? His name slipped my memory. The Norwegian rider from, from Motorola. Yeah, who, yeah, yeah. Who also passed away in his last race. Stenerson, Stenerson. Bjorn, Bjorn Stenerson, yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was, I mean, that I wouldn't wish that on anyone to, you know, obviously for the family. It was, but it was quite an, 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 an Italian funeral, you know, it's quite um, something to behold, I think. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, one other thing you were, you were famous for in the Peloton um, is uh, some, I want to show this picture here. Um, and I, know, I don't know if you can, Tell me something about this on the top. What can you tell us about this picture? What's particular? Why do it? Why do you think I showed you, I show you this picture? Why? Well, because yeah. I guess I'm being aerodynamic, which <laughs> you, need to be, you need to be if you want to go fast. Yeah. That's not why I show you this picture. Yeah. What uh, about the brake levers? The, my brake levers. My hands. Exactly. Bars. Exactly. Yes. The handlebars, uh, and, 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 and the shorts. So, uh, as we can see on, on, on the picture below, this is a, a current or, you know, a few years ago, Sean Yates, if we go to the next picture, well, hold on. Not only is that a great picture, but it's also a great comparison to the, the 92 picture. Cause then we can see how much weight he lost in yeah, those exactly. couple of years. I mean, look exactly. how much leaner he is. Exactly. Yeah. But if we go to the next picture, uh, a close up of, um, you know, what I just, what I just, uh, told you. So first of all, my question, Sean, and, and I guess George will probably, he's been a cyclist. How could you ride with the brake levers in that position? I mean, <laughs> how does that work? I mean, how can you even be on the, on the hoods? Well, <laughs> I I don't know. I guess I was. <laughs> uh, I always had the hoods. But when I started riding in time trialing, you know, in a time trial, you would you would have the hoods around that position on a time trial bike. You know, you wouldn't have them up like a climber. Yeah. Because you just you, know, you would always hold down the bottom. Um, and I like the hoods right down there. So when I climbed out of the saddle, my arms were kind of straight fully extended almost, you understand? So I could there really was... just pull rather than, rather than having them, you know, at right angles, which you have to do if you've got your hoods right up there, you know? So there was some and... really, really, really scientific thinking about uh, behind this, behind this. Um, you know, I always, I mean, it always I mean, blew my really mind when I saw you. Right. In... Did you know that, yeah? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you, well, when okay, you were in the peloton. on the hoods a lot. And if you look at, yeah, no, we're talking about aerodynamics. Um, it's well documented that today's riders, obviously, with the aerodynamics, with your arms, your True. forearms, forearms at right angle, you save 15, 20 watts, you know? Yeah. And obviously, that was what I was doing. Um, the reason I had my hand up, I was pointing up. So I really like when I, when I had my hands on the, in drops, that they were kind of wedged in that circle you understand yeah 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 well it's... some guys had their hand of my point down like you let your hands just slide off the bottom you know but it looked it it looked strange i i mean it always looked strange to me when you were next to us you know i said well this like how the hell can he drive drive his bike you well, know johan we'll be then 10 years from now we'll be asking the guys from today the same question how they ride with their you know their hands all the way I, in probably we'll be, george we'll be i know questions. yes but that's a general tendency Sean yeah, yeah. was unique. Oh yeah, he was exactly. definitely unique. You know? What about those shorts? What about those shorts? Okay, Sean? So if, they, uh... if we go to the next, if we go to the next, uh, the next picture, that's another another thing that Sean was famous for. In 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 in, uh, I don't know if you can if we can see it properly uh, all the way, but uh, the short the leg, short the sh short short. Yeah, was that were those were those custom or what? How'd you do that? <laughs> the short behind them was that when I moved to Nice, you know, I used to spend a lot of my time down at the beach, <laughs> and in those days, the four shorts were quite short. So, if you had long cycling shorts, you would have, a, you know, the tan line up to just <laughs> above your knees, and then you had a, a two inch part where there was no tan and, and then you would have your ball shorts 
<laughs> you look pretty stupid, you know? <laughs> so to avoid that, I started riding with my shorts up so I could move my tan line up so the ball shorts would cover that, you know, cover it, cover the white part of my leg. Wow, but that I, I never got, knew that. Yeah. And then but then I got kind of used to the fact that the the chalk, the, the elastic bit was around kind of the widest part of my thigh, which <laughs> felt felt good or felt <laughs> I didn't like it when I went down towards the knee. But now you see I've got completely the opposite. That's what yeah. that's why I put that contrast, Sean. I mean yeah, I've gone right you know, down. You, you went no, the other way, like, and obviously, it, to me, then it looks like you're not going to the beach that much anymore. No, I'm not going to the beach. I do go to the beach, but yeah, not as much. And maybe I'm not chasing the women like I was, you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's no real explanation as to why I chose, I don't know the one I just men mentioned, but I am quite particular, or was quite particular in a, in a few areas. Um, it's something that you just got to let me get on with, you know. <laughs> but oh, uh, yeah, Lorenzo Lepage used to look across at me and say, yeah, Yates is in his swimming trunks, you know. <laughs> We're going to be in for a good day. Oh. That's funny. So, so, Sean, I know we realize we're like, hopping around uh, so many different years and uh, stories from your career, which they're endless. And uh, I mean, this show can be hours and hours long, but I think we, we'd be remiss not to bring up 2012 when you won the Tour de France with Bradley Wiggins. Um, what an amazing year. I was there. Bradley was like in, in robot mode and, uh, you know, he's one of the funniest guys I know and great personality, but that year you can tell he was uber focused. My question for you is how did you handle, you know, the person, the different personalities you had Bradley Wiggins, you had Mark Cavendish who was going there for stage wins. Bradley was obviously going, going for the overall. And, um, it was to me as an outsider, I was racing as well on BMC and talking to Cav, like he would go around, like anybody want to give me a lead out? Anybody want to give me a lead out? Like anybody need a sprinter next year? Like he was joking about it, but you can tell he was feeling a bit, you know, lost and left out of the, the team, so to speak, but you guys pulled it off. He won stages and Bradley won the overall and it was an incredible, incredible Tour de France victory. So talk about how you manage those two personalities and some of the cool stuff that happened that year. Well, I think, you know, when I joined Team Sky in 2010, the goal was to win the Tour de France within five years, you know. Um, after the first year of a new team, is always going to be tough, you know, but we show signs um, of, of, of brilliance, if you want to call it that. The next, the next year was better still. Obviously, Bradley crashed out the door. Um, we got up there in the, um, in the Volta, as well as winning Dolphin A and other races, you know, being up then Pan East, so on and so forth. And it kind of, it was just the, the perfect storm situation, really, I think, that when we came into 2012, it was a natural progression that this is the year type thing, you know. Obviously, without the athlete committing, it's just not going to happen. But Bradley, like you say, he just was a different beast that, that year, almost, you know, right from the winter, he decided to take private flights to all events. Um, and it was like in December, he was doing 40, he did a couple of 40 hour weeks in Mallorca. Everything, it was just in robot mode, like you say, you know, no distractions, just on a mission. And obviously, came out swinging. And we just got in this, in this routine of, of, winning everything and like i said it was a perfect storm because yeah we we had a super team richie port mick rogers through me you know these these guys just and also at that time in 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 the world of pro cycling there was no one really like that and we had this kind of mystique about us and everyone just pretty much laid down and surrendered you know, no. because we just came out swinging right from the start, you know, Volta Agave. We won like five stages, GC, time trial, team, whatever, straight into Pan East, win that. You know, it, every race that I went to with the team, we won. Dauphiné um, also. Dauphiné, 
Romandy. He would have won Catalonia, but the weather would turn really bad and we had rubbish wet weather gear. Um, he would have won that easy. So we would have won every stage race for sure. Um, we still won a stage in, 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 in Catalonia with, um, big, with Rigoberto. But yeah, it was just a perfect storm. How do I, yeah, so that leads me on to your question was how do I manage it? Well, in my head, we were there to win the tour and that was it. Mm -hmm. There was no discussions and, you know, and obviously <laughs> Cab is, a, is, a, is a, quite a character and a winner. I knew he was used to winning and having a team work around him. Um, so now obviously coming into the race, it was clear what our goal was. But at the same time, we had cab. So it's like, okay, we, if we can pick up a few stages or, you know, but we certainly weren't going to be committing to a lead out train, this, that, and other. You know, we were there to win the tour. We had a team to win the tour. We was, lost one guy quite early on, so we already down to eight, you know. And there was no there was no men for cab. So it was kind of, you know, and that's just the circumstance it dictated. Um, it just was not going to be any lead out situations. And yeah, obviously that they, we had that massive crash on one stage where Cav got, got, got caught out <clears throat> and he, he wasn't happy. But I just said, you know, but basically I just said, I don't care. We're here to win the tour and that's it. Yeah. As it turned out, at the end, obviously won four stages, I believe, um, you know, culminating, well, the last two, you know, won that stage, Bradley let him out. Then the last stage on the show, leading, led out by the yellow jersey, um, in world champions jersey, you know, that will never happen again. Yeah. And not, not but it, it won't, it, obviously, that you never say never, but being two British riders, you know, um, it, it, it won't happen again. So, all there and all as well that ends up really obviously with the whole Fumi kind of debacle, you know, um, which you know I was there in the bus. It was crystal clear what the, what the what the deal was, and uh, there was only four guys who were present. That was me, Froome, and Dave Brailsford and Bradley. So you know what was spoken in that bus, I knew. So Froome went against what was spoken. And Brad didn't like it or got upset, but you know we managed to hang on and uh, yeah, get first and second basically, and, and a bunch of stage wins. Do you yeah. think Froome, so, Do you think Froom could have won that tour? For sure. Who would have chased wow. him if he had attacked? Yeah, Everyone was yeah. just whining for third place. Yeah, 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 yeah. At least second, you know. I mean, yeah. he could have attacked, and I did. You know, I did. Play with the idea that he had attacked him quite a fair. Who was going to chase him? No one. Yeah, yeah. And he would have ridden off. But, <laughs> but it's, it's, I mean, it's, it says a lot. It says a lot to 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 your personality, Sean. That you know, you had a plan. You stuck to the plan. I would say probably uh, for for the team and 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 Bradley Wiggins being the 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 British icon, probably better to have Bradley Wiggins win at that point than than Froomey. A hundred percent. Yeah, but but you know, I mean, if if we think about if we think about this, you know, you were you were actually involved or at at the at the beginning of uh, this first official marginal gains plan, you know, which was constructed to win the Tour de France in 2012, which has now become basically the normal way of operating for for many teams. Um, what do you think? So this was 2012. We're now 12, 12 years later. Um, obviously, everybody has adopted Team Sky from back in the days, that that kind of way of working and perfected it. In the meantime, Sky now in EOS has been surpassed by certain teams. But do you feel like that's really the, the blueprint that's been used now and being perfected nowadays by all these top teams? Well, I think... You know, obviously, like you mentioned marginal gains, and and that is a is a is a kind of phenomenon which is, is you know is is true because every little gain adds up. They are marginal, but they do add up. And we were the first, yeah, to to put that into action, as well as obviously having the great athletes 
um, and, 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 and catching everyone unawares. It, it, like I said before, it, it was the perfect storm situation. Yeah. Obviously, at a certain point, other teams, you know, start to realise that an issue is not just about the watch you produce, you know? And that, the start of the whole, the arms race, as we call it in the UK, amongst the tiny, tiny fraternity, it's not necessarily how much, how many watch you produce, it's how much, how deep your pockets are, you know? Because <laughs> 7,000 pound skin suit is pretty much guaranteed to be faster than one that costs you, you know, 70 quid, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and so on and so forth. And yeah, and now it's just this ongoing battle to develop, you know, faster tires, faster wheels, faster clothing, faster helmets, everything. Which obviously had also has consequences in that the bunch is going much faster as a whole, but the roads are not changing. They're getting less cycling friendly. So therefore, the accidents are, you know, more frequent possibly. And then when they do happen, there are great consequences. The team, the, the speed's higher. Um, so obviously, the UCI, the government body, has to kind of somehow keep control of this situation because it's clear that if one team has their brakes facing in and therefore they're saving 10 watts, that every other team in the bunch has to do the same mm -hmm. pretty much. Otherwise, you know, w w where is the limit? There should be, there are rules. There, there need to be rules and, and yeah, so they concocted this idea that maybe it's unsafe for the construction of the bar to have the have, you know the brakes face in. But the reality is that there needs to be clear rules. And I mean, and everyone takes a mickey about the sh the sock measuring, you know, but if they didn't have the sock, everyone would be riding around with socks up their knees. <laughs> which I believe, George, you guys were the first to trial, no? Uh, yeah, compression compression socks and, way and back aero when, socks. You know, uh, yeah, it yeah. was proven to be all aerodynamic mm. and also help circulation, blah, blah, blah. You know, so, yeah. you know. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. people would take the mickey of the use side because it's an easy one to control, you know. Um, but like I said, you need rules and, you know, I think uh, the marginal gain scene, you know, you know, now they're all running anyway, around 30, 30, 30 millimeters of tires for bar because the roll resistance is much rather, you know, much, much better. We said they also knew way back when in 2003, when I talked to the guy from Hutchinson, he said everyone rides with their tires too hard. Um, because it's not absorbing the bumps, the minute bumps in the road, and therefore it's causing you to lose traction and, and you know, lose watts, so to speak. Yeah, anyway, yeah. we kind of went off on, on a tangent there, didn't we? <laughs> no, I think it's I think it's, it's great. I mean, that's no, uh, we have there's many yeah. many many more stories. George, do you have anything else? For, for well, sure? I mean, I, I mean, I know we're we're running out of time here, but John, you were known as one of the hardest men in the peloton. And this question actually comes from our my good friend Bobby Julik, your friend Bobby Julik. Who's, Bobby? Yeah, who's, I used to share with him uh, quickly. I said we used yeah. to share. We get to ten o'clock, and Bobby there in bed reading a book, and it'd be ten o'clock. <laughs> I say night, and I switch, turn the light off. <laughs> and he left there with his book in the pitch black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard that story too. But he, his question is, you were known as one of the, the hardest men in the peloton at your time. Who's your hardest man now at this, in, in today's peloton? Today's peloton, I don't, you know, there's some tough guys out there. One of my favorite guys is Dylan Van Baal. Yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a stud. He just gets on and does it, you know, machine. Uh, yeah, one of the few, one of the few guys that can do Paris Bay and pull up, you know, one yeah. of the last guys on the on a on a on the mountains stages as well. Yes. Yeah, good good um, one. But obviously, you know, back in my day, I would say Sean Kelly and yeah. Yoan Museo. They were the two. They were the two beasts. Kelly well, in particular. 
George, those are two guys we should try to get on uh, as one of our guests also for for the Move Legends. You know, yeah, for sure. Ali and, Ali and Museo. That's, uh, yeah. that's you just gave us a good a good uh, a good hint there, Sean. Yeah. John, one last one last thing. Um, you um, until recently, like two three years ago, I guess, no, uh, that you you had your last uh, function as a DS with uh, with uh, Eolo Eolo Cometa, no, yes, young yes. a bunch of young guys. What do you see in the new generation in the young generation? Although I mean, they're they're probably they were not the top guys, but still. What do you see has been the biggest change in the mentality of today's generation compared to, you know, generation of George, then you, and you were at CSC with Ivan Basso and, and your generation, of course. What's the biggest change that, that, that makes the difference nowadays in cycling? In that mentality? It makes, a, makes a difference. I don't know about makes a difference. Obviously, you know, in, in, in all, all in, in every course of society, you know, the kids are, the youngsters are completely different these days, you know, um, they want everything here now and, and yesterday type of thing. They have everything that they, they need to make life easier for themselves. Um, and that's expected. And if they don't have it, they kind of kick up a stink. I think, whereas we were much more, you know, we need to work for it. We need to gain respect. We need to earn, you know, um, I mean, I didn't get to use a deep pair, deep dish pair of wheels until I get yellow jersey in the Tour de France. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was riding around in training, type of thing, you know. <laughs> um, but um, I, I don't. It's, it's progression, you know. You can't really yeah. compare because you know, in in nineteen thirties, they would have said that we were a bunch of softies, type of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. When so. No, obviously yeah. comparing generations is is, is pretty pointless um, because you are where you are at, in any point of time, and you have to do what you can. You know, agreed, to, agreed. To get on, um, and 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 obviously you are the best at the time. Also, you know, of of who's around. You know, you've got to be in it to win it type of thing. So, you know, I think obviously everything in society's got more competitive. Um, you know, whether it be fucking selling heaters or, or being a pro bike rider, you know, the, the margins are very fine and it's not enough to have a pure talent because, you know, you need also all the help or the the equipment and, and this and the other, you know. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really like to compare yeah, no, no, no. That was not my. That was not my point. No, not my I know point. you. I know you. I know, but it was quite a difficult question for me to answer personally. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. Anyway, I guess it's yeah. also it's also the the constant you know access to information. They know everything. Yeah, they have access exactly. to everything. I mean, it's just it's, instantly, it's, right? So, it's, um, it's obviously, like, it has to translate um, into performance. You know, when when we turn pro, we have no mobile phones, no yeah. no computers, nothing. Yeah. Then we yeah. no sat there. We how the hell did we get to places? Yeah. And, and, think, and Sean, think about how malnutritioned you were. I mean, you said you yeah, barely yeah. needed fuel, but you actually did. It's just nobody else was eating properly, so you guys would just be running on fumes at the end of the races. Where now? I know. I, mean, I know. They That's, train their bodies to the, eat. Yeah, yeah. If we had all the data, like yeah. you know, of the timing, the time of the clients, we would have seen that. And someone, you know, and you think how how come there was no clever enough in the cycling world, obviously there wasn't to figure out, you know, and make the calculations and time things. Not, you know, there were clever guys around in the 60s. You know, they, no. they built their, the, the SR-71 Blackbird went Mac 3.2, you know, um, <laughs> in the US. You know, no. so, but they just went in cycling. And I started yeah. when um, the guys uh, figured things out. But yeah, I mean, you know, I think, um, yeah. Time so now, okay. I think George, we, we, you know, we can we can make this a two or three hour. I know, episode. I know, I know. I know. But, yeah, thank you, Sean. It's I'll been just, I'll um, say, I, I just wind this up, um, if I may, with, with that fact. Yeah, you asked what at the start of the show what I was doing this and that. I still won my bike. I've got an event in May 
which is a 365k gravel race, ride wow. race, which I'm doing um, in Girona. Um, Are you organizing it? No, no, no. I'm I'm riding it. 365k. Yes, which often, uh, and I'm in partial in, in per, permanent atrial fibrillation, and I'm yeah. completely pacemaker dependent. Um, so this, I still like the challenge is what I'm trying to get at. And this, completing that is, is a greater challenge than it was for me as a fit person to finish the Tour, Tour de France. So I'm not shying away from challenges just yet. Wow, that's, wow. that's amazing. So will we'll you ride on down with your we'll son also? That. My son is going to do it as well. Both okay. my sons. One doing the longer one, which is well, 560. Let, let, Let's get you to uh, my. Let's get you to my event in October. I Love know. To have I know you. You that'd be, that'd be yeah. fun. Yeah. Also, you're not awesome. doing. You're you're just doing the medium one, the the three sixty five. Your son is doing the five sixty. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, this 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 sums it up, George. This is this is yeah. why Sean is a legend. Absolutely. And why he's nicknamed on Wikipedia the animal. Yeah. You know. And I got I got my own, thank I, you my autobiography out, which is. It's called. It's all about the bike, and that pretty much sums up my life. In that, yeah. it's all about the bike. Yeah, it is I'm all about. The bike. Maybe I'm saying no. I'm yeah. take it. <laughs> <laughs> Love thank, it. Thank you very much, Sean, for uh, for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure. pleasure to catch up. Hopefully, you, we see each other on the route on the road sometime. Yes. Uh, thank you, George. I'll, yep. I'll let you go with thank your you, day. Always nice to um, catch up. Sean, great to see you. Thank you so much, and uh, hopefully, we can see each other this year. Yeah. Thanks everybody for tuning in and, and, and bye for now. Yep. Bye bye. <laughs>